Um, thank you, everybody, for uh, coming uh, for this talk. Um, given the time uh, this, at the end of this long conference, I thought this will turn into a one-on-one -on -one or one-two, maybe two or three conversation. Uh, but happy to see so, so many of you show up uh, and attend the talk. So thank you. What I thought I'll do today is uh, keep it um, more of a storytelling session. Uh, I've been working uh, with many security practitioners in small, medium, large enterprises over the last five plus years and, and helping them secure their applications. Their applications that face the web, uh, the internet applications. So this is all about uh, their struggles that I've observed in the last five years, some of the trends that are going on in the industry that are creating new challenges for existing stable security environments. Um, so hopefully some of this is, is going to resonate with some of you. Um, I'm happy to hear feedback uh, if anything is, you know, not uh, what you see or what you experience. So keep it, keep it an interactive session uh, and see how it goes. A quick introduction. Uh, uh, my name is Amaya Tulwalkar. I'm the co-founder and chief product officer at Sequence Security. Um, we are providing uh, application security platform, which does bot mitigation as well as uh, threat mitigation or, you know, the OWASP, WAF type of uh, threat mitigation for applications for all web, mobile, and API. Uh, before Sequence, I, my battle scars are from Symantec. I, I owned the entire anti-malware stack at Symantec, uh, shipped software with the click of a button to 200 million the endpoints, and that was a lot of fun, um, and some prior contributions at IETF. Um, so this picture represents all the trends that are going on. This is pretty much all the first four trends that I'm going to talk about, and the fifth uh, uh, trend is all about uh, the threats that are evolving. Um, this is a busy slide, you know, but it really covers all the four uh, trends that, that we have going on on the enterprise side, not on the threat side. And at the end of the presentation, we have some recommendations on how to deal with these trends and are these, uh, are these best practices uh, suitable for you. So let's uh, jump right into it. The first trend is a journey to the cloud. Um, not something new. Uh, pretty much everybody here uh, must have had some experience going to the cloud. Um, what we find is enterprises are in various stages of their journey to the cloud. Um, if you are in an environment where you are purely deployed in either a cloud environment or purely deployed in a physical data center, congratulations, you're lucky. You don't have to worry about a lot of uh, things here. Um, but what we find is most most enterprises are moving from physical data centers, going to a public cloud, um, and also some of them have experienced the public cloud and moving back to a more private cloud environment. So this is not necessarily running on, you know, older stacks. So the new private cloud environment is running, you know, OpenShift and other modern stacks. Um, all the same benefits of the flexibility of a public cloud but running in your own environment where you have complete control over it. Um, so the challenge this um, uh, creates for security practitioners is where do you put your security? Where, do, where is your perimeter, right? So in the old ages, everything was secured in layers from the, you know, the outer edge all the way to the application. Um, now the, the perimeter has shifted. It can be some of it in, in your prem, some of it is in the cloud, some of it is back to your private cloud. So where do you put perimeter security? Um, some enterprises think that um, the answer to that challenge is I'll put all my peri uh, security or perimeter security at the CDN layer because most of these enterprises, most of these applications are running behind CDNs. And CDNs today offer a variety of security solutions, uh, WAF, bot mitigation, and few others. So the answer uh, could be that your security is now living with the CDN vendor. And that brings us to our second challenge, which is people are now using multiple CDNs. Um, and how this happens is there are many, many different reasons for it. 
Um, we have um, worked with a small social media company that has three different CDN vendors. They choose it because one vendor is particularly uh, good at uh, serving static content, images, and, and things like that, and the other vendor is good at uh, dynamic content. Um, there is some push around, you know, uh, uh, edge computing where CDNs are doing a lot of dynamic content generation at the edge. Um, it could be as simple as acquisitions. People acquire companies. Um, the acquiring companies have established relationships with CDNs. Um, sometimes the security is already there. So they don't want to rock the boat. Um, therefore, you end up with multiple CDNs. Uh, we have lived with uh, at least one of our customer who during our deployment has moved from one CDN vendor to another CDN vendor. And just imagine the pain you have to go through when you have all your WAF rules, all your security put in one, uh, one CDN and now have to transfer all of that into a completely new CDN. Um, it has, it was very painful, uh, based on our experience. Um, so yeah, so the parameter, which, you know, could have been the CDN has now again shifted to becoming multiple CDNs. If you manage that, I think the third trend is around just the uh, proliferation of uh, APIs, right? So previous older monolith applications are now broken into multiple APIs. And what really used to happen is you had the monolith and then the, the front end of the apps used to talk to multiple backend services. Those services are now breaking into various microservices and some of them are directly accessible from the outside. So all your WAF rules and, and other security uh, tooling that you did for just a few apps that were accessible from outside now rep needs to be replicated for all the hundreds of microservices that are directly communicating with mobile apps, with your partners, uh, with your suppliers, what, what it, whatever it may be. Um, so your security surface or your attack surface as, as a whole has certainly uh, increased tremendously because of this. The next trend is, is uh, compliance. Um, and this is no big surprise here in Europe uh, with GDPR. And, and uh, in, in, over in the US, we have uh, CCPA, which is Cal California Consumer Protection Act, uh, which is, uh, some say it's even stricter than GDPR. The challenge with this is if you choose a security vendor that depends on uh, looking at sensitive data, um, it is taking traffic either out of your environment for security, for inspection. Um, you are now worried about, is that vendor causing my GDPR compliance at risk? Is that vendor going to cause me CCPA problems? Right. So um, handing over security to a third-party vendor that does magic in their cloud is all great, but it brings another challenge about the compliance, the law of the land, and, and where is my data residing, right? So you have not only the consumer privacy concerns, but you have to make sure that your, your consumer data stays in the, in the geolocation that the consumer comes from. And that can be a huge challenge if you, if you use something that is, you know, taking your data out, uh, into their private cloud, um, and securing it. So these are the four trends that are that are that are related to the enterprises. Um, the fifth trend is about the attack surface. Um, there is very little talk at this conference about, in general, the automated threats. Um, but but based on our observation, we think this is the the fastest growing attack surface um, for applications. Um, and this is about bot attacks. This is about automated threats. Um, they come in various different uh, formats or, or types. Uh, OWASP actually has a complete different category dedicated to it uh, under the automated threats uh, category. Um, but this can be, this can lead to many, many losses. Um, you start with um, almost every single uh, industry suffers from credential stuffing account takeover problem. Um, Similarly, um, fake account creation 
I we just uh, read that Facebook uh, deleted about about three billion fake accounts recently. Uh, LinkedIn recently deleted about half a billion fake accounts, and these fake accounts are just a a launching pad to a lot of bad things that happen behind behind that. Um, if you are a retail uh, vendor, um, they, then you're suffering from scraping. Um, it could be simple things like price or inventory scraping. It could be as severe as the case of Uber versus uh, Lyft, where um, the help program that was developed by Uber was impersonating drivers or customers of Lyft and, uh, you know, scraping um, um, fair information. It was also scraping driver information. Um, so it can lead to uh, severe business impact, um, including um, you know, loss of IP and, and, and IP theft. Uh, if you are um, retail customers, uh, enterprises, then uh, then you you could be subject to automated shopping. You could be subject to uh, locking your inventory, um, which is inventory denial of uh, attack. So, depending on who you are, um, the airline industry and, and hotel industry uh, suffers from seat spinning um, and, and hotel reservation scams, things of that nature. So, this is this is just escalating. Um, this very rarely makes the newspapers. Um, if you if you uh, if you suffer from the OWASP top ten categories and then it leads to some other breach, then it's going to make newspaper. These attacks actually hit your bottom line. This hits you with your profit. This hits you with the fraud losses that are that are, that are enormous. And, and most often, they don't make the newspapers. So a few components that are um, that I covered here on the left hand side, I forgot to mention them. But really, what what is behind these attacks are different four different components, which is just the ease of available credentials in the market. Um, the different infrastructure that is easily available for rent to the attackers, um, the different tools that are easily available, um, and again, the different behavior uh, patterns that they can choose from these tools. So the first is credentials. The, there is an estimate about 14 billion uh, credentials are leaked in the underground, and they keep going up every single day. Um, these are some of the the recent uh, breaches that have contributed to these 14 billion credentials. Um, I don't even see some of the, the older ones that used to be very popular, but um, last year alone it was close to 11 or 12 billion. So every year it keeps going higher and higher. I'm pretty sure all of us have at some point received an email from some company saying your, your credentials were uh, detected as compromised. We need to reset your password. Um, and what that happens is those credentials are now being tried on many, many different sites. Um, the industry works very efficiently. As soon as certain credentials are validated, um, you immediately see them posting on different forums. They are sold from anywhere from a few cents per credential to a few dollars in certain cases. Um, um, yeah, the, the industry is extremely efficient in, in, uh, in, in networking and sharing the, uh, the, these credentials. The next, next is uh, tools. Um, the tools are getting better and better. I just have one screenshot from the most popular tool uh, in, this, in this space. Uh, this is Sentry MBA. Um, you have plenty of videos uh, of this tool on YouTube. Um, you will find that people are now skinning this so that uh, there is a version of Sentry available just for certain sites. Um, I don't want to take any names, but there are several YouTube channels that are showing you um, this user interface for attacking certain sites. Um, they also sell configuration that goes along with it. So this is extremely customizable um, per site or per application. Um, these configurations sell for anywhere from $5 to even $500 in some cases uh, in the black market. Um, there are others like Hitman and Sniper and many others that are coming up. Um, but the real good ones are, you know, custom developed 
um, attack tools that are targeting certain applications. And now I come to behavior, which is um, how do they behave on, with the applications to how much effort it takes for them to uh, behave like real human beings so that uh, you know the obvious detection tools or protection tools are, are not able to detect them. Um, but it also uh, gives them tremendous flexibility in, in customizing um, their behavior in the sense that this is one of the sites that's allowing you to select the bot that you want to run on Nike. Um, uh, just Google search for Nike bot, you will see at least a few hundred hits on GitHub of various different Nike bots. And all they're doing is when Nike comes out with a special edition shoe, um, they're going to use one of these bots and completely take or, you know, suck the inventory out and sell it in various different secondary markets for 3x or 5x the price that Nike is selling for. Um, why Nike cares about this? Um, and I, I don't pretend to be their spokesperson, but I've uh, had some interactions, is they care about user experience. They want to make sure that real users are able to buy their products at the right price. Um, and so this is a big, big, big problem, not just for Nike, but but similar companies. Um, but you can see in this case, there is a lot of competition going on for selling their bot to the attackers, right? There are so many versions of them. The next is uh, cyber criminal infrastructure, and this is a, a fascinating area of interest. We just published a, um, a research on, on this thing called bulletproof proxies. Um, you can you can get the URL here and download it, or if you want to stop by in the in our booth, you can get get a copy of it. Um, this is you know we, when we actually published the report within a, a week or two, I think even <coughs> Brian Kerb started talking about it. Uh, we are now collaborating with, with him on on the the next stage of the research. Um, but what this is is a, around using um, residential networks or residential IP addresses, um, or in some cases, some unused IP space in the hosting providers um, to completely defeat your geofencing. And the workflow that we have identified and in, in, in available for people to go through acquiring these IP addresses is, is also very fascinating. You can see that you can choose um, you know, either a residential proxy network or you can choose a, you know, unused IP space in, in, uh, in the ISP, um, or some hosting providers. Um, one of the key things that it does not only defeats the geofencing, but it is also, um, <clears throat> uh, able to, um, uh, the, the, the max minds of the world, right? So the geo, geo IP databases, completely miss this. They think that this is a legitimate IP coming from a legitimate country, whereas the actual IP is owned somewhere else. Um, so all, all of those details are in the report. You're happy to uh, share some details with you offline or, or give you a copy. Um, I was just talking to, a, um, to an enterprise uh, on Wednesday in London, and they are purely blocking the bots using IP addresses. And what they worry about is if I block... A, a you know bot attack using IPs because of bulletproof proxies, I might be actually blocking a real customer um, because these these IPs are you know shared between real users and at the same time their home routers are compromised, their um, cameras are compromised, or they they might have some other IoT devices that are completely compromised. Uh, this is the geo distribution of these uh, these. Uh, these bulletproof proxies, um, it is very prevalent in, in pretty much all the geographies. Um, so no particular region is immune to this. Um, we thought initially this was a problem mostly in the, in the Western world, but it's not the case at all. Um, and they are using, um, IPs from dominant, um, local Either telco or residential um, ISPs um, to to uh, to um, to make it look like the yeah. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. Yes. The reason for going after the the most the top tier ISPs is that enterprises are that much risk aware risk averse to block IPs coming from Comcast. So if I'm a if an if I'm an American enterprise, I know most of my you know end users are Comcast or uh, you know AT and T customers. So I'll be very scared to block an IP from from Comcast. And that's the reason why they go after these. And there is a war going on in this industry. There are, at least we are tracking two different um, underground um, gangs, if you will, um, that are competing for, for, for their services. So um, if you go in the underground, we have some pictures and uh, stuff in the report where they will be one, 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 one outfit has, I think, 10 million IPs to, to, to rent and the other one has 30 and they, you know, they keep fighting each other with, uh, with different pricing and whatnot. It's a, it's a real operation. For, and some other stats around, um, uh, is, is, is again fascinating that, um, you know, most of these, uh, IPs seem to be attacking mobile apps, um, not a whole lot of, of web apps. Again, I can't point out why, uh, but this is just the data that, that we are able to collect. And some, some of the sources are, um, you know, places like Akamai, they, they also say the same thing. So let's get uh, into, uh, you know, some of the attack examples. Uh, I have only a few of them. Uh, to share. Um, the first one is account takeover. I think there was just a talk about credential stuffing uh, in the previous slot, so I don't want to go too deep into it. Um, but this is really the first step. You you get, you know, these 14 billion credentials, you try, you know, a few million at a time, and if your success rate is anywhere from 0.1% to 0.5%, you have a wealth of credentials to to use them for for various purposes. Um, the next set of uh, activities that happen once these credentials are validated can can cause a lot of harm, right? Whether it's transferring money from your account, whether if you're a financial institute, um, whether it's um, creating um, if you're in the uh, social media um, uh, space, then they go after this thing called romance scam, which is the current generation version of the Nigerian prince where they send you messages to your, um, you know, social contacts about somebody's sick, I need to, you know, some money, can you wire it, you know, things of that nature. So this, once the accounts are compromised, there is a lot of damage that comes behind it. Uh, the point I want to make here is that you were worried about web and mobile apps before, but in more and more cases, the APIs are also equally, uh, you know, vulnerable because more and more applications are, uh, or enterprises are directly exposing their APIs, uh, to the internet. So if you have protection on the web, if you have protection on the mobile side, um, watch out for those APIs because the attackers are not going to go after the biggest door with the biggest lock. They're going to find a door that has, has no lock on it. The second one is fake account creation, which is, uh, we touched upon it uh, a little bit. Um, many different things uh, can, can come after uh, people creating fake accounts, including uh, the romance scam example I said. But it, it also includes things like automated shopping, things like, uh, you know, denial of uh, inventory. Um, the denial inventory is interesting. We saw a case last year in, 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 in the U.S. where uh, a company made a political uh, statement or a, took a po political position and somebody was completely upset with that company for taking that political stance and a kid wrote a script and routed the, the, the attack through all the residential proxies to lock down that company's inventory at a large retailer. Right, so this retailer is is a three billion uh, per year retailer, it's a large retail company. Could not sell one of the top brands they sell for three days because of the fake accounts being created and the inventory being locked in those fake accounts in the shopping carts for three days. Mm -hmm. 
So next is uh, content scraping. Um, I think this is this is interesting. Um, I talked a little bit about the Uber versus Lyft. Uh, another example is uh, is in the social space. Um, we uh, you know a video uh, sharing um, social network around the video sharing uh, you know uh, experience, um, and all of their IP is embedded in the videos that users create and upload on their site. And 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 one of their competitor was. Um, Actually, creating fake accounts, going after the the the, the most liked users, and pulling down their uh, their their videos because they were able to then decode those songs and and steal the IP from from those songs. So this is where you know this is not just about you know simple economics. This is an existential threat to that company because the competition is scraping their IP um, um, using bots. Um, other examples are retailers suffer a lot uh, because of uh, very highly competitive nature, nature competitive nature of their pricing strategies. So if you have a sale going on in one retailer, the other retailer wants to know what's your pricing, how much inventory you have to go, you know, and and uh, go below your pricing or uh, and and figure out the inventory strategies around that. Um, so. Of all the things that we we talked about, um, uh, scraping uh, actually leads to um, another problem, which is um, cost of doing business. I mean, if if fifty percent of your uh, traffic in an enterprise is is scraping, just imagine the cost that you're paying to serve all the bots all the way to the application tier, right? So you're over provisioning your your servers your hardware or your ecs ec2 instances um you're paying too much for the bandwidth to either your service provider or or again to to your to your cloud provider um and those network costs especially can be can be uh, huge um so not just scraping but other types of bot attacks also lead to um you guys um, or enterprises losing money um because you are completely over provisioning your um, your your infrastructure i don't have many other examples um i wish i did but uh i want to come to um the 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 some of the recommendations um uh, to address these problems right so number one is um application security consider something that you know can secure the application wherever it goes whether it's in in a physical data center whether it's in the public cloud or whether it's in the private cloud right um and if you have all three of them think think about how can you best secure these applications where the security solution is able to move along with the application the second is look for vendors or or solutions that will not uh, you know breach the uh, the the compliance requirements in various geographies um challenges around you know sending your traffic completely to a private cloud and 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 relying on them to um comply with uh, with the gdpr or ccpa um just double check that that they are able to provide you with the proof that they are they are following the laws the third one is security needs to keep uh, with the development and this is a problem of you know devsecops has to be as fast as devops um a lot of times we find that devops is way faster than devsecops and the security people find out new applications that are completely exposed to the internet only after they are being attacked um and so solutions that um give you visibility of all the all the applications that are running in your environment are are positive um the other is if you if if security solutions require instrumentation or modifications to the apps before they are published just to secure them then your devsecop is slowing down the devops cycle and in this day and age that's hard to to uh, to convince the business that security is slowing down um, your your business so look for solutions that hopefully don't touch the applications for security um the th- the fourth one is open and extensible right uh, you don't want a complete black box solution when 
you have an attack uh, going on or a campaign going on, and, and the only thing you can do is, you know, call somebody on the phone and, and hope that they solve the problem. Um, um, we believe in open platforms for sec security. You, you need to take advantage of all the different t tools that you have in your infrastructure, whether it's a SIM or an anti-fraud solution um, or a bot mitigation solution or a WAF or a firewall. Um, why not combine all the intelligence from all these different tools um, to make the best judgment? Um, because if you stop a real user from 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 accessing your uh, your application, you could be you know losing money and on and revenue. So uh, solutions that talk to each other can import uh, data, export data, work with each other. Um, you know, work with playbooks, you know, whether uh, through the so SOAR vendors and whatnot. Look for those um, open solutions rather than uh, closed solutions. And the last one is just look for solutions that are protecting all the apps um, equally well. Um, the challenge here is if you solve, if you have a one particular solution on the web, a different solution for mobile and different for APIs. Um, again, it's going to slow down your, 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 your DevOps cycle. Um, or it's going to leave applications completely exposed, um, because you don't have equal protection on all of them. And no matter how much secure you make your web or mobile applications, your APIs are going to lose, uh, lose value. So these are the five recommendations for the original problem uh, statement, which is what's going on in your environment. And with that, I'll open it up for questions. You are Maya. Any questions? If so, please raise your hand. No, oh, I thought so. Did you really do such a good job that no questions were? But there's a question. Um, I just have a question about um, server. How does uh, serverless fit into that space of application security trends, especially like hardening um, serverless functions like an Azure functions or uh, lambdas, as well as attacking them? Because I think there's a, that's a big trend yes. is for attackers at the same time yes. hardening. So what, is that part of one of those trends or like strategies that you just explained? It is included in that. You know the this, the API the you know applications being broken into microservices and the microservices service could, could be completely serverless. Okay. Right. Um, and and again, you have to find uh, ways to secure the serverless applications. You need to find the the right ingress point and and things like that to find. If you're looking at perimeter security, if you're looking for something else, you need to you need to think about that. Yeah. Okay. Are there any specific it's recommendations you can you can give Sorry? about serverless uh, functions? I can. I mean, let's take it offline, and okay. I can. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, what about this digital transformation? Many companies they want to bring down their business settlements. So instead of having the manual process, they mm -hmm. they are integrating directly with their APIs mm -hmm. and with the system to system. Mm -hmm. Now the perimeter totally differs. Correct. So previously okay. I have a different perimeter. Now because of that introduction of new company, which is doesn't I belong to and I don't have any influence, the perimeter totally changes. Yeah. So how do I ro come up with a, a kind of a scope of security program to ensure my platform is safe and allow the business functionality to spread between the companies. Yeah, so B2B is, as I said, I think I covered it here. Um, your, your, those APIs are going to your partners, right? So B2B is covered there. You have to think about <clears throat> even the partner specific applications as you know exposed to the internet because you can't enforce just your app your partner is talking to them you have to consider them as part of the attack surface and look for so they, they are part of the perimeter you you can't exclude them <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't Any other I mean, the questions thing is, remaining? If you provide the same functionality, if it's, whether it's business value, right, to your consumers and to business partners and have all the protection on the apps that are serving the consumers, the attackers are going to find the, the, uh, the applications for the partners and, and they'll use them. So it, it can't escape that perimeter defense. 
Any other questions? Ah, yes. Um, yeah, you suddenly paint a very dark picture. You think it's a losing battle? Sorry, say that again. Uh, is it a losing battle? Is it still? Uh, yeah. Um, I don't think it's a losing battle. Um, it's just that um, it's like every enterprise is different. You need to think about who you are, where are your apps today, where they are going. And, and, and look for the right strategy to solve the problem. Um, uh, I'm not recommending one solution over the other. Um, but yeah, these are absolutely solvable problems. Anybody else? Going once, going twice. Okay. Oh, well, there is actually. <laughs> So I'm, I'm well aware of anti-automation industry that's uh, growing. Um, I was actually there 10 years ago and, okay. I mean, try to pitch the same things, but no one would listen. Um, is there any OWASP solution, open source solutions for anti-automation? I mean, you, you talk a lot about the problems. Yes. The, the, I think the OWASP has a 20, Different list of categories, categories right? But right? where are but the I tools? I don't think I am not aware of an open source project that that solves the problem. Unfortunately, not. Okay, maybe it this is the place to initiate, to right? Sorry. Um, maybe this is the place to initiate. Maybe call for yeah. you know, absolutely project. Yeah. Okay. Okay. If there are no further questions, thank you, Amaya. Thank you.